Good. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, friends. Uh, I'm a proud uh, member of the board of uh, WIDER and also a, a proud member of the board of WIGO. Uh, so I'm very happy to be at this, uh, at this session. Um, much of my work is actually on, uh, uh, info in this area, is on, uh, is on informality and labor. Uh, along the lines that Marty and Imran uh, uh, talked about, and, and the work of WeGo is, of course, very relevant here. So uh, in some sense, if I, if I talked about that, it, it may be repeating a few things. So I thought, let me just take a different perspective on this altogether and talk about tax policy and informality. Uh, because in fact, in, it's, a completely unrelated, it's, it's a completely different literature. <laughs> it's a different discourse altogether. It's the IMF Fiscal Affairs Department which deals with those things. But the terms informality, uh, we must tax them, and so on and so forth, appear in that, in that discourse as well. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and, but essentially, it's a variation on the same theme, which is that viewing informality as an aggregate lump is analytically wrong and leads you into policy, uh, uh, policy errors. Uh, and I want, to, I want to sort of talk about that in the context of tax policy, just as Imran and Marty have talked about that in the context of labor, uh, labor regulation. Um, so these are some papers that work, this is work jointly with Michael Keane. Uh, there's a technical paper, then there's a, uh, a more general paper in, in finance and development, which you're welcome to look at, and then there's a blog piece in Vox EU uh, recently. Okay. So when you look at tax challenges and we look at documents which lay out tax challenges for developing countries, informality is always put as a challenge, as a problem uh, at the top. Taxing the informal, informal economy actually leads the ADB's tax priorities in a, in a, recent, in a recent document. Uh, and reducing informality is put as the objective of tax reform. That's what we should do. We should reduce informality. Okay? But what, what, what does this actually mean to reduce informality? And is it a, is it a useful <laughs> guide to policy that we use as an indicator of the success of tax policy, some measure of informality coming down or, or, uh, in, in that context? So when in, the, in the tax context, in the public finance context, uh, insofar as any precise meaning is given to this term, and, it, and actually I should say that in discussion of informality taxation is very, very, it's really quite imprecise, uh, it's usually mean to mean, simply mean to, uh, taken to mean non-remittance non of tax. If you're not remitting tax, you're part of the informal sector. If you're not remitting tax which you're due to pay, you're part of the informal sector. Okay. But the point is that there are all sorts of reasons why a firm and individual might, pay, might not pay a tax. <laughs> they could actually simply be below the threshold at which the tax bites. Uh, or they could be avoiding tax, or they could be evading tax. And each of these things actually makes a big difference from the analytical point of view and from the policy point of view. Mm -hmm. So uh, the basic point that we make, that Mick and I, Mick Keen and I make, is the reason why a tax isn't paid may matter for policy making as much as the fact that it is not being paid. And because those numbers that are added up to say this is the total amount of informality. And in fact, the structuring of our tax systems should look not simply at the overall number uh, of, uh, of tax unpaid or informality, but why those taxes are not paid. So as, I, as we say, uh, we believe that this is a much more useful strand of analysis than the general objective of aggregate info, general analytical target of aggregate informality and the policy objective of reducing informality. So let me give you a conceptual example. Okay, consider the VAT, which we're in almost all countries. There's some threshold level of sales above which an enterprise pays a fixed, uh, fixed tax on all of its sales. That's a VAT threshold. Yeah. And in addition, uh, enterprises face some sort of compliance cost in, uh, in, in complying with the tax. So suppose, for example, that there's some natural firm size which would exist in the, in the absence of the tax. This is their total potential sales. So in a world without the tax, there's this division of firms into where big sales, uh, large sales, small sales, et cetera. And now introduce this tax which says, if your sales are above this threshold, you pay VAT. What sort of responses does that lead to in the, uh, amongst firms? Well, you can think of different, uh, different sorts of responses. One is that the firm whose potential sales are above the threshold stays below the threshold, perfectly legal, but it doesn't pay tax because it's below the VAT threshold. Alternatively, you could think of a firm which fully pays up uh, its tax. It's, it, it's, it's above the threshold, but it decides to pay. And you have things in between where the firms could avoid, could under-report uh, under its sales. Or the firm could become a ghost firm, as they say in, in, the, in the literature, and, not, and just disappear from the books altogether. 
These are all different responses that firms make and that, and that we know they make uh, to, uh, to attacks. And we, uh, uh, Mick Keen and I, we look at this and, we, uh, and with this setup, with costs and benefits of doing each of these things, you know, avoidance is, is, is costly, evasion is costly, hire those clever lawyers and, and so on and so forth. Uh, with a set of reasonable assumptions, we, we argue, and you can look at the technical paper, that firms can plausibly fall into five categories, ranging from the smallest in terms of those, that potential sales uh, to largest. <laughs> what, is that, what might that look like? Here it is. So we have what might be termed micro-enterprises. These are the smallest of all, and they're below the tax threshold. They're below the VAT tax threshold. Then you might call that the adjusters. These are the next size up, and these firms will go just below the threshold. And they'll be hiding, so to speak, just below the threshold. At this end, they're the compliers. They're very large firms, and you know, the cost to them of avoiding or evading is just too large, and they just fully comply and pay up. And in between are, so to speak, partial. People who partially evade the tax, and they under-report. Okay? And of course, there's a cost. If you get caught, you're going to be punished. There's a probability of getting caught, which may depend upon your size, etc. So you have to model all of those things in your, in your economic analysis. And then in the middle, you have the ghosts who just simply disappear from the system. The tax administrators tell us that this is not, a, not too bad a, a, a way of describing what actually happens in the VAT, in the VAT setup. Okay. Now, our central point is the following. What here is formality? Well, formality technically defined are those firms which comply with the tax law. It's this category of firms. Therefore, informality, of course, is the complement of formality. Therefore, all these are informal. But this, all of this is comprised at least of four separate categories. This is a bit, little bit like Marty's <coughs> triangle with the different categories of informality in the, lab, in the labor arena. And there are different economic incentives uh, in each of these different categories. Because each, the, the boundary between each of these categories is dependent upon balancing the costs and benefits of being here versus there, being here versus there, being here versus there, et cetera. Okay. So overall informality is all these four categories. But our argument is that analytically and from the policy point of view, it's very important to know which of these categories any firm is in. Let, let's do an ex a small exercise. Uh, this is what I just said. By definition, the formal enterprise are those who are complying. The all other categories are informal, <laughs> but every informal firm is informal in its own way, to quote a famous opening line of, a, of an old. So consider the following key policy choice, which, which is often put, which is choosing the level of the VAT threshold. It's a classic policy choice. Where do you choose the, the, the VAT threshold? And indeed, when people say, let's reduce informality, what they really mean is reduce the threshold at which VAT bites so that you get more of those uh, small firms into the tax net. That's a classic policy uh, trade-off that you face uh, in, in, in policy context. In fact, if I go back to this diagram, what I'm doing is changing the threshold here. That is not going to affect the choices over here at all. Right? The choice for a firm over here is between complying versus partially evading. The costs and benefits here have nothing to do with where the threshold bites up here. Where the threshold bites is over here. These choices are where it matters. So changing the threshold will not affect this, this boundary at all. Therefore, it will not affect the division between formality and informality as is seen as an aggregate. But changing the VAT tax threshold leaves, leaves aggregate informality, the measure, unchanged. I've just shown you that, because aggregate informality is all of that, and the threshold is over here somewhere. It doesn't affect this balance at all. So changing the threshold does not reduce informality. In fact, it doesn't change measured informality at all. But obviously, it has economic, real economic consequences. Why? Because it affects these, the composition over here. Some of these firms will now, the incentives to hide below or hide above are going to change. Okay? And also, some of the, it, may, it may spill over into some of these categories also. So there are real economic consequences of changing the threshold, which is not captured by our standard measure of formality or informality. And that's the general generic point that I want to get across. And there's a lot of technical stuff that we do and so on that 
an aggregate target of reducing informality is analytically wrong and but leads to huge policy errors. Okay, let me now give you another example, another type of issue, bringing together the labor regulation and the, and the, and the tax policy issue. Okay. Of course, most firms face not just tax thing, they face labor regulations. And in fact, they face many different labor regulations. So suppose we have multiple regulations, a tax-based uh, system of regulations and, and a labor system based on regulations. So firms now face two choices. Those five categories are now multiplied by five. Actually, it's five times five. It's not five plus five. It's five times five because you have to decide, am I going to comply with this, comply with that, either, neither, both, uh, at each of these levels? That's how you have to set down the technical problem <laughs> when you have two sets of regulations. The firm's problem is where to lie relative to each regime, and it's a joint problem that the firm faces. How do you then define formality and informality? Is an informal firm which complies with the tax regulation but not with the whatever? Is one, is one non-compliance in a set of regulations, does that make the firm informal? Is it the union of all the uh, non-compliances or is it the intersection of the non-compliances? See, we haven't thought this thing through. We haven't thought about it at all in terms of what actually constitutes our core definition, conceptual definition of informality. And indeed, uh, uh, Mick Keen and I do an analysis of this multiple regimes, of two tax regimes. You have a VAT regime and an income tax regime and together. And we show that actually you can say sensible things. You can say sensible things about choosing the threshold on this versus choosing the threshold on this. That's a question. <laughs> will lowering the threshold on this what will that do to this other thing? Because it may lead to some changes in terms of firms complying or not complying on this side. Okay. So combining these two, you can indeed say sensible things about where the threshold should be chosen. But it has nothing to do, nothing to do at all with reducing the total level of informality. Ready? That's it. No, it's finished. Uh, so, uh, conclusion, informality is not going away anytime soon, as, uh, uh, as, inform uh, as Imran and Marty mentioned. The term informality is not going away anytime soon either. Yeah. However, I think we have to be clear about the concept and the definition. And there's a lot of looseness, a lot of looseness uh, in, in the literature. And especially in the context of policy, we have to be very, very clear and analytically uh, uh, rigorous. And our basic point is that an aggregative concept and measure of informality, of course, captures some aspects of reality, but it obscures uh, more than it reveals. Thank you very much. <laughs>